Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this second part of the video, we're going to look at exponential decay and also modeling data. So from the previous video, you'll remember that we talked about exponential growth models, but we did not talk about exponential decay or logistic growth models. So that's what this video is about. So we're going to pick up where we left off with the definition of exponential decay model. So an exponential decay model is a type of mathematical model or a mathematical function for exponential growth or decay. The function was f of t equals a sub zero or a naught times e to the kt exponent, or you can replace f of t with a. So a equals a sub zero times e to the kt exponent. The only difference between growth and decay was we found out in the previous video that if k is positive, then this is an exponential growth function because the amount or the size of f of t or a is growing. If k turns out to be a negative number, so remember k is in the exponent and it was either the growth rate or decay rate. If k is negative, then the function is decaying or decreasing over time. The a sub zero is still representing the initial amount and it always occurs when time equals zero. So it's representing a decaying entity when time is zero. The A still stands for the output amount and it's a function of the time T. And K is a constant that this time is representing the decay rate instead. So that's the difference between the exponential growth versus exponential decay. It's the value of k. If k is negative, then we're going to be looking at, in this video, exponential decay models. The other difference comes up in terms of the graph. So we're going to be looking at the graph on the right. This is for an exponential decay function. This is when k is a negative number. So this is called the decay rate this time. The other thing that's similar is that a sub zero is still the initial amount and it's when time equals zero. And it's represented on the point on the vertical axis or the y axis. Now, notice for exponential decay, the function is, rather than increasing without bound, the function is decreasing as you go to the right. So as time increases, the amount of the substance or amount of or size is decreasing, but it does not decrease indefinitely or like uninhibited growth. It looks like the function is decreasing, but it's approaching the horizontal axis, or in this case, the t-axis. So this is a horizontal asymptote. y equals 0. Or, since we're calling the output the a, so a equals 0. So the function does not decrease indefinitely. The function will decrease until you get closer and closer to the t-axis. So similar as the last video, we're going to be taking given data to determine the value of k, but this time it will be a decay rate that we'll be finding. And then once we find out the value of k, we can use the exponential decay function or model to make predictions. So let's look at this example. The next example is going to look at an exponential decay where it's determining the age of a fossil or an artifact. And this, is, this process is called carbon dating. The method where we are considering the percentage of carbon-14 remaining in a fossil or an artifact can be modeled with an exponential decay function. So we can look at how much of the carbon-14 or the percentage exists in the fossil or an artifact over time. So the reason why carbon dating K 
can be useful is that every living organism has carbon-14 and as the organism dies then the amount of carbon-14 decays exponentially and what's called the half-life of carbon-14 is approximately 5,715 years. So what does it mean by half-life? The half-life of a substance, a, usually a radioactive substance, is the time required for half of the given sample to decay or disintegrate. So here's an example of carbon-14 half-life. So the carbon-14 half-life is 5,715 years. Now that might differ depending on what reference or textbook that you refer to. Some textbooks will make it 5714. Other textbooks will make it 5,780. But ours uses 5715. So let's say you have 100 grams as the initial amount of carbon-14. Well, let's say how, see how long it takes before you lose half the amount. So let's say you go from 100 grams to 50 grams. Well, this will take 5,715 years because a half-life means if you start off with 100 grams, it will take this many years before you lose half of the amount. So 57, 15 years, you'll have 50 grams. Let's say you go down to 25 grams. Well, it will take another half-life, another 5,715 years to go from 50 grams to lose half the amount again. So half of 50 will be 25 grams. And this takes another 57, 15 years to do so. So this is where carbon dating can be effective. You start off with 100 grams after about 11,500 years. Now you're down to just 25 grams. So you've lost 75% of the carbon-14, but it took 11,000 years to do so. Carbon dating is useful for artifacts and fossils up to about 80,000 years old. Older objects do not have enough carbon-14 to determine the age with any certain accuracy. So in example two, we're going to use the idea of carbon dating. The half-life of carbon is 5,715 years for the amount of carbon-14 to have decayed to half the original amount. So we're going to come up with an exponential decay model or exponential decay function that represents the decay of carbon-14 over time. So an exponential decay function, we know what this will look like because exponential growth or decay have the same form. So it'll be a equals a sub zero e to the kt exponent. But what makes this decay is that k will be a negative number this time for the decay rate. So let's go back and look at what does it mean for 5715 is the half-life. After 5,715 years, the initial amount, which is a sub zero, will decay to one half times a sub zero. So if a sub zero is the original amount or the initial amount, it takes one half life or 57, 15 years to decay to half of the original amount. So this is the amount that we're referring to with the A. It's time is 5,715 years when the amount is one half times A sub zero. So let's make that substitution. One half times the initial amount, but we don't really need to know what the initial amount is to do this. 1 half times the initial amount is equal to the initial amount times e to the k, and then t is 5,715 years to have half of the original amount left. So now notice this becomes an exponential equation 
because k is the variable and it's in the exponent that we're trying to solve for. So let's go through the steps on how to solve this exponential equation again, just like we did in the previous video. Isolate the exponential expression, so divide by the coefficient, which in this case is the initial value, but do it on both sides. And notice that a sub 0 will cancel out on both sides of the equation. So that's why we don't need to know the initial amount. It just cancels out anyways. 1 half is equal to e to the 5,715 times k exponent. So remember, if the exponential expression has base e, you want to use natural log because they're inverses of each other. So take the natural log on the left side and natural log on the right side of the equation. We know that natural log of e to an exponent is just the exponent. So this becomes natural log of a half is equal to 5,715 times k. And then if we want to isolate the k, divide both sides by 5,715. So natural log of a half divided by 5,715 is equal to k, which is approximately equal to, so let's grab our calculators. So type in natural log of 1 half, or you can put in natural log of 0 0.5, but then divide by 5,715, which was the half-life, and it gives you an answer in scientific notation because the decay rate is extremely small. It's very close to zero, but notice that the k is negative. It's negative 0 0.3 zeros, because it's times 10 to the negative 4, and then 1 to 1. So negative 0 0.000121. To 1. That's the decay rate for this carbon-14 isotope. So once we know the k, then we have the entire function. The exponential decay rate we just found. So the function is a equals the initial amount, which we never needed to know, times e to the k exponent, negative 0 0.000121 times t. And t represents the number of years of decay. So once, once the organism dies, then that's when the time begins, because that will be the initial amount of carbon-14 after the organism dies. Once we know the exponential decay function for carbon-14, then we're ready to talk about carbon-14, carbon dating. So in 1947, earthenware jars containing what's known now as the Dead Sea Scrolls were found by an Ur Arab herdsman, and after the analysis of the, of the scrolls, scientists determined that the linen wrappings around the Dead Sea Scrolls contained 76% of their original carbon-14. So keep in mind that linen comes from a plant, and plant is a living organism. So whenever they use the plant to make the linen, um, there was 100% of carbon-14, but then over time, the amount of carbon-14 decays. And so when the scientists found the scrolls, there were only 76% left of carbon-14. The problem is asking us to determine the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls using the exponential decay function that we found in the previous part for carbon-14. So in the previous part, exponential decay function was for carbon-14, a equals a sub 0 times e to the negative point zero 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 one two one t. You want to keep as many decimals as you can to keep the accuracy in your answer. So let's go back and see what the 76% of the original amount of carbon means. 76% of carbon-14 remains of the original amount. Let's write out what this means in terms of a sub 0, because a sub 0 stands for the original or the initial amount. So 
76% of means multiplication. The original amount is a sub 0. Now you can change that to a decimal. So 0 0.76 times a sub 0. And this is going to represent the amount of the carbon-14 when the scientists um, determine um, the amount of carbon-14 remaining. So let's go back to the decay function. We're going to replace the A with 0 0.76 A sub 0. So 0 0.76 A sub 0 equals A sub 0 E to the negative 0.000121t. So we know the decay rate from the previous part. This time we're going to be solving for t because it's asking for the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, notice that this becomes an exponential equation because t is the variable and it's contained in the exponent with base e. So solve the exponential equation first by dividing by the coefficient, so isolate the exponential expression by dividing by a sub 0, and again notice that they cancel out on both sides of the equation. So 0.76 equals e to the negative 0.000121 times t. And again, this is base e, so you want to use natural log. Natural log of 0.76 equals natural log of the right side of the equation. And just like before, we know that natural log of e to an exponent is just the exponent because these are inverses of one another, so these cancel each other out. Natural log of 0.76 is equal to negative 0.000121 times t and then divide to isolate the t. So divide by the decay rate on both sides of the equation. And so this gives us t is exactly natural log of 0 0.76 and then divide by negative 0 0.000121, which is approximately, and grab your calculator, so it's very good practice to type this into the calculator. Natural log of 0 0.76, close the parentheses on the natural log, and then divide by the decay rate. Make sure you include the negative, 0 0.000121. So this tells us that the Dead Sea Scrolls, when the scientists um, did their analysis, they were 2,268.07 years old. 2000 268.07 years old. So do not round to the nearest whole number. They're exactly or approximately 2,268.07 years old when the scientists determine their age. So that gave you an idea of how to use carbon dating where we found out the decay rate for carbon-14. One other way that you can find out the decay rate very quickly or even the half-life, if, if you have the decay rate, is to use what's called the half-life formula. And we, we looked at this for doubling time in the previous video, but it can also be used for half-life or decay rates. So the growth rate, or it could be decay rate, K, and the doubling time could be half-life, T, and they're related using this equation. K times T equals natural log of 2. That means if you take the decay rate times the half-life, you should get natural log of 2. If you solve for K, then you get this equation, or this formula. K equals natural log of 2 divided by T. So this means if you know the half-life, which is T, then you can find out the decay rate very quickly using this formula. Just keep in mind that the k must be a negative number. Or, if you take this equation and solve for t, then you come up with this formula. t equals natural log of 2 divided by k. What that means is that if you know the decay rate, then you can find out the half-life of a substance. So let's try this out with the last example. So in the last example, 
we knew that the half-life of carbon was 5,715 years. So let's try the middle formula. If we take natural log of 2 and divide by the half-life, 5,715 years, notice that you get the same value of k, except just notice that there's a negative sign that's missing from what we found in the previous example. So it's negative 0 0.000 and then 1 to 1 for the decay rate. So this gives you a very quick way to find out the decay rate rather than solving an exponential decay function. All right, the last thing we need to look at in this video is what's called logistic growth models. So from population growth to the spread of an epidemic, nothing on Earth will ever grow exponentially indefinitely without bound. So we saw this in the previous video. Exponential growth functions are called uninhibited growth because the function will continue to grow indefinitely. Well, that doesn't happen, not with population growth or the spread of an epidemic. There are some factors that will limit uninhibited growth of an exponential function, and these are called logistic growth models. So here's an example of a logistic growth models graph. Notice that the horizontal axis is the variable t, so it's representing time. So right on the vertical axis, we have the initial amount. And this is always when t equals 0. So it looks like the function looks like an exponential function at first, because it's growing very quickly. But then there's going to be this point, and it's called an inflection point, where the graph will go from an increasing rate of growth to a decreasing rate of growth. So it's still growing, but growing not as quickly as it was before. And it looks like over time, a long period of time, this function will grow and it will hit this line. And this is a horizontal asymptote. So it looks like the graph will approach a horizontal asymptote over time. And in terms of biology, this number, this horizontal asymptote, is called the carrying capacity. Or, in terms of math, it's sometimes called a limiting value. So limiting value of the function, or it could also be called carrying capacity of an ecosystem, a nature preserve, a protected area, or an island. It just some um, finite amount of area, and you have only a limited amount of population that can live on that island or ecosystem. So before we get to the last example, let's look at the definition of what's called a logistic growth model. It's a mathematical function or model for limited logistic growth. So limited means that eventually the function will hit a horizontal asymptote over time. The function is given of this form, f of t equals c divided by 1 plus a times e again to the negative kt exponent. So the negative is part of the formula. Or you can have f of t replaced with an a, capital A. So all the constants in the problem are going to be positive. So c, a, and k are all positive. So wherever you have logistic growth models, they describe the growth of a population and the limiting value, and we saw that with the graph, is called the carrying capacity when you're talking about, usually in biology, environment, ecosystem, or nature preserves. So here's an example of a logistic model in example four. You have a ship that is carrying 1,000 passengers. They have the misfortune of being shipwrecked on a small island and the passengers are never rescued. The population of the island after t years is given by a logistic growth function and it's representing p of t for population 5,780 divided by 1 plus 4.78 e to the negative 0.4 times t. So part one says find the population of the island 
after 0, 1, 2, 5, 10, and 20 years. So let's do a couple of these together, and then we'll do the rest with the calculator. We're going to find out that the population grows very quickly at first, but over time the population will grow, but not as fast as it originally did. So let's try this in the graphing calculator. Notice that we are replacing the t with a zero. So that would be 5,780 divided by 1 plus 4.78e to the negative 0.4 times zero. So if you type this into the graphing calculator, make sure you put an extra set of parentheses around the denominator. That way you add those, these two terms, before you take 5780 and divide by that answer. So 5,780 divided by parentheses around the denominator, 1 plus 4.78e exponent negative 0.4 times 0 in parentheses, and then close the parentheses on the denominator. So the population of the island was 1,000 people. This should make sense because there were 1,000 passengers originally, and when time equals zero, this is the initial population. All right, so let's use the graphing calculator to find out the population for the remaining years. If you have what we just typed in from t equals zero, if you hit second and then hit the enter button or the equals, you'll get what you last typed in. Well, notice that the only thing that will be different will be the value of t, so scroll over using the arrow keys to change zero to a one. The population after one year is 1374.84. Now, since we're talking about population, this is not 0.84 of a person. So always ignore the decimal entirely. Do not round up, do not round down, just ignore the decimal. So the population of the island was 1374 people after one year, two years. So change the T to a two, 1,836.21. And again, ignore the decimal, so 1,000 836 people. So after two years, the population was a thousand originally and almost doubled in two years. Five years. So after five years, the population is 3509.62. So 3,509 people. So after five years, notice that the population more than tripled in five years. Let's go another five years. Maybe the population triples again. So second, enter, change the exponent to a 10 this time. And the population is 5,314.70, or just 5,314 people. Don't forget about the units each time. So notice that the first five years, the population more than tripled. But the next five years, between 5 and 10, the population did not even increase by 2,000. So notice, back to the graph, that the function is still increasing, but not as rapidly as it did before. So this looks like a logistic growth function. So one more to calculate, 20 years, and notice the population barely increased at all. It was 5770.75, or 5,000. 770 people after 20 years on the island. So that last 10 years, the population only went up 3,056 people. So barely increased at all those last 10 years. So this gets into the last part of the problem. What is the limiting value or the carrying capacity of the island? Well, the carrying capacity occurs carrying capacity or limiting value occurs when the amount of time approaches infinity. So we're going to look at what happens whenever time increases indefinitely. What does the population of the island approach over time? Because it should 
B approach any horizontal asymptote. So let's grab the graphing calculator one more time. Let's go to second enter, and this time, instead of going up to 20 years, let's go up to 100 years. These passengers are stranded on the island for 100 years. The population of the island is 5,780. So from 20 years to 100 years, the population only went up 10 people. So this looks like the population is going to exceed no more than 5780 on the island. Let's try one more value. Let's go up to 1,000 years on the island. Also 5780. So it looks like the larger I make the value of t, the population will approach 5780. So that is the carrying capacity. And is 5,780 people. So that would be what's called the limiting value or the carrying capacity of the island. So what are some of the factors that can go into the, to the carrying capacity being only 5780? Well, there could be illness or disease. There could be a finite amount of resources on the island that would could limit the amount of food and water available. Um, there could also be predators on the island, or the island could also suffer natural disasters. So there are always some factors that go into how large the, can the population reach. And it can reach no more than 5780 people in this case. So this finishes out our discussion on exponential decay and logistic growth. If you have any questions about any of the examples that we talked about in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework involving exponential decay, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video.